Hey, good morning, everybody. Today is a great day. My name is Stu Turley, and President and CEO of the Sandstone Group, and I've got a, mm, a climatologist, and one of the hits uh, that I really enjoyed getting to visit about, and now we get to talk with Dr. Janet Cur Judith Curry, and she has a new book coming out. So thank you very much, Dr. Curry, for stopping by. Oh, my pleasure. Now, we were just chit-chatting right before the show, and you were up in uh, Reno, is that right? Yes, I am. I'm just on the tail end of all these big atmospheric river events <laughs> that have been oh my lasting California. So we're not getting it nearly as bad as the Californians, but we're still getting enough to make life interesting here. Oh, my goodness. Now, you've got a nice, for our podcast listeners, uh, I'm over here in Dallas, Texas, all nice and calm and everything. And Dr. Curry, you're up there and you've got a heavy coat and you're inside. So what's up with that? Oh, OK. Well, <laughs> furnace went out um, and we need a replacement furnace. So I want to go with the uh, um, heat pump inverter situation right and there's some electrical problems that preclude that the electrical problems can't be dealt with until all the fallen tree branches have been cleared away we've been getting the what we call sierra cement snowfall it's extremely wet snowfall wow. and we have all these big juniper pine trees you know with the leaves and they just get weighted down and boom you know it's just um horrible all the big tree branches we have down so as soon as and, and the tree guys can't get in until right. the snow has melted so, so you, know, you don't have any natural gas or propane huh uh well we, we we do we have another in another part of the house we do have a, a gas furnace and we have gas fireplace you know so we're managing but i'm a little bit <laughs> extra bundled up <laughs> at the moment well, uh, Dr. Curry, you are a climatologist, and uh, you've had a very great career throughout everything. And you have a book coming up, Climate Uncertainty and Risk, Rethinking Our Response, uh, Anthem Environment and Sustainability Initiative. And it is coming out, I believe, on... Uh, I think it's July out? at this point. Um, you know, it's slow. Yesterday... I got the peer reviews back. This is an academic press. I wanted it to really go out for a very thorough peer review. Right. And, and they did that and it took a very long time. And the response is very favorable, but the comments say, oh, I have to rewrite this part, you know? Oh. So it, it, it's motivated me to, you know, I haven't, I haven't even looked at it for a couple of months, which is a healthy <laughs> thing. And then when you come back to it, you've got sort of, a fresh look at it and right. some of their responses did trigger some ideas for making it's the first part you know once you get into the meat of the book you know it just right. it, but but getting it there's a chicken and egg problem what do I talk about first and you know and, and that was the hardest part and that's the part that I want to rewrite but I'm not going to take too much time rewriting because I want to really keep this rolling so that it does come out in the summer so I'm pretty excited about it Yep. It's going to be a pretty unique book. So. Well, um, your other textbooks, I love it that you're a climatologist with textbooks. When I was in college a bazillion years ago, um, I mean, we actually had heavy textbooks and we actually had to go to school and learn things. I was looking at your textbooks and they're pretty good. Uh, you got some material out there. Oh, yeah. Um, a book that I wrote in the 90s, Thermodynamics of atmospheres and oceans i mean that was pretty widely used as a textbook um and i think it still is they wanted me to do a second edition but uh, you know i just moved on and then there's another book that we wrote that's really for graduate students microphysics and kinetics of clouds i can't remember the exact title but right. it was something like that um and that was with a a, a russian co-op collaborator he was actually the first author and it was fascinating because it really merged the russian scientific thought on this subject with western thought and they had really evolved in different directions right russians like in the 
the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and even into the 90s, really didn't have much in the way of computers to do their research on. Okay, right. and so they were good mathematicians, and they could, you know, just do it on pencil and paper. Uh, right. you know, compared to over in the West, we're just doing these big computer modeling things. So it was a very different perspective, and it was a, an insightful thing that if you make this approximation, then you, you know, you really had to think about what was actually going on, rather right. than just, you know. <laughs> look at computer output, you know, from a model. So it was a very interesting experience. And I learned quite a bit from that. So, um, you know, those were the old days when climate scientists had, you know, a deep education that was physics and chemistry based. Right. These days, it's more what I would call climate studies, <laughs> rather than, you know, it's not physics and chemistry based based it's about climate right it's not you know into climate and of climate so there's a lot of people out there these days calling themselves climate scientists who have a very shallow understanding of the fundamentals and you know it's one of an old an old crusty professor emeritus like me you know in the good old days we you know we knew a lot more and we had a much better education but I'm sorry, it is sort of true. I mean, there's right. there's some university programs that are maintaining the strong tradition and hardcore geophysical sciences and physical chemistry and stuff like that that are the foundation of our field. But there's also a lot of fluff programs. And, you know, you can get a master's degree by, you know, reading the IPCC reports and watching right. a lot of YouTube videos and writing some essays and boom, you've got a master's degree in climate studies or something. So, you know, it, it's, there's, it's, you know, at this point we, we, we've, <laughs> we, we've let, we've long left our scientific moorings and, you know, we're off in politics oh. land. And so as you're you're being thrown around out there as as being a climatologist and now that you're debunking it and you're all of a sudden they were not happy with you i mean it was kind of like uh, what are you thinking and well okay it's more complicated than that okay tell me um, hardcore scientists don't criticize my arguments or whatever okay great. i got i got thrown into the denier camp when I started criticizing the hockey stick and got Michael Mann upset. Okay. 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 And, and that was, you know, you can't. And also when I started saying the IPCC needs to be more transparent, they need conflict of interest guidelines, whatever. When I started criticizing the IPCC. Okay. Those were my sins. It was right. criticizing the climate establishment and more um, importantly, being critical of Michael Mann. You know, that was the end. Then I became a denier. So, but I mean, wow. pe people who understand the science, you know, would never, would never call me a denier. No, but you sit back and kind of go, um, when, when uh, it seems like when people pig pile on you, it's for the wrong reason almost anymore. You know, if you even make one comment, they'll just jump on you because you had oh, some yeah. I, I, I've ceased caring about what you know the silly stuff on social media you know I've long ceased caring yeah. about that you know I'm interested in having conversations with serious people and, and I dig deep into yes, problems you do. <laughs> when, I, when I do when I have a client or do a report or something catches my interest I dig deep I, you know, I don't tr try to you know do something superficial or whatever what is everybody else saying about it no <laughs> I'm, i might look at that after the fact but that's certainly not where i start no uh dr uh, curry i really uh, liked your website uh, judithcurry.com uh, i believe is what it is you've got some nice articles out there and i was looking at one of them now the the article the uh post that was just put out uh, academics in the grid part one and part two um russell schusler schusler yeah. thank you um i'm from texas i would have butchered it so thank you very much um okay the articles are like five five pages 
but there's like 7,000 pages of comments and interaction on that. And that's fabulous that you're getting that much interaction on your website. Oh yeah, well, in the old days, I used to get more, but I that was before I moderated it. You know, I, I didn't want anybody to accuse me of censoring any viewpoints or whatever. And so it was right. really pretty rough terrain. Uh, but then I started moderating it, but more for decorum and civility, right. um, not for, I don't moderate out stupidity <laughs> or your, you know, political perspective or whatever. I don't moderate it. as long as people are civil, right? You know, they can play. So it's I don't have as much traffic as I used to, but I've got a a pretty interesting group of commenters for the most part. Um, Russell Schusler, some interesting backstory there. Um, when I first, I don't know maybe almost even 10 years ago, maybe eight years ago, he submitted, he just sent me an email, right? You know, you know, I'd like you to consider this post as a guest post. And he called himself planning engineer. And I thought, oh, well, wow, this is really good. And I posted it. I didn't know who he was. You right. know, he wanted to keep totally anonymous. Mm -hmm. And at some point he outed himself to me. He didn't want to be outed more broadly, but he was the vice president of planning at the Georgia Transmission Corporation. Oh. Okay, and I was at Georgia Tech at the time and you know, they were practically neighbors. And so, you know, I actually went out to visit the Georgia Transmission Corporation and met with engineers, VPs and all sorts of different people. And they gave me quite an education on, you know, what the issues were um, in operating the grid. You know, it was an education for me, but having, Russell Schusler contribute to my blog, you know, was quite an asset. So he retired maybe five years ago. Okay. And we were friends on Facebook. He was out having a ball, you know, all these wild skateboarding and acting in community theater and, you know, high adventures. He was, you know, he, he just went crazy with adventures, it was great. And then right. after a couple of years of that, then I started getting some posts again. He started writing again. And now he's fired up. He's got so many ideas. And he's he met a collaborator through my blog. This is Roger Kaiser. He's the skeptical environmentalist of New York. Um, I don't yep. know if you've come across him, but he's another really interesting person in energy space. Right. And he has a blog and whatever, and he's very knowledgeable of what's going on in New York. So it's one of the fun things about the blog is that I've developed this network of interesting people, not to mention ones with a lot of expertise in a broad range of areas. Right. So, it's, you know, really good resources for me to draw on. Well, the the article that I I, I just I thought it was really, really cool from uh, Russell's perspective on the grid. And when you're putting in there, uh, Meredith, uh, I got to interview Meredith uh, from Shortening the Grid on Well, too. She, I imagine you know her from uh, her book as well. I thoroughly enjoyed learning about the renewables versus putting them on the grid. And there is a gigantic difference going on in there that people are just saying you can't throw them on there. Um, and I mean, that's what he was talking about in his little articles here. Where do you want to go from here besides your book? You're going to have to sit down and, and between now and the summer, take a look at that. Okay. No, not really. Okay. So I have a company, Climate Forecast Applications Network. The, short yes. Hand, yeah, CFAN. It is right over here. Yeah, Sorry. CFAN. So we, we founded a company in 2006, and our idea was to try to apply weather and climate research and knowledge to helping people manage weather and climate related risk. Right. And our, our first, pro you know, we started off with a wide range of projects. Our first project was actually uh, flood forecasting in Bangladesh. It was really a humanitarian project trying nice. to, you know, they get engorged with floods and, you know, they get totally wiped out. And so with some advanced right. warning, you know, even five days, you know, they can walk with their cows up to 
someplace higher, <laughs> take right. their seat with them, and then they avoid the catastrophic losses that they would have otherwise incurred, not to mention loss of life. Right. Um, so, and and that was funded by, you know, like World Bank, USAID, those kind of things. And we did a technology transfer and, and a, a group in South Asia is now running our model and giving those warnings. Right. And then our second client, okay, this was, it was a an oil company, a petroleum company. And th this was in 2006, 2007, following Hurricane Katrina, Rita, remember all those right. horrendous and they institute, you know, natural gas prices just went through the roof. Right. And natural gas trading had started during that period. And so what they said, well, what we want is somebody who can forecast hurricanes that might impact the Gulf, you know, with two day lead time before the National Hurricane Center. Right. And and they thought maybe, you know, I said, oh, sure, we can do that. And the idea we initially had was right, wait, you know, is not very good, but we did develop, uh, you know, a completely unique way for making, you know, longer range forecasts for them. And then, then they loved it. Um, right away in 2007 was the, the first year that we're making forecast. There was one going into the, this was Hurricane Dean, and it was predicted to go straight to Houston. Well, you're Houston, Texas. You might even remember this, 2007. And we said, it's going to Mexico. You know, I think you're okay. So everybody, you know, so, so they knew, <laughs> you know, so they could sell high. <laughs> right. And, you know, they, they apparently made good money on that. And then the next year in 2008, Hurricane Ike, you might remember right. that one. That was a big one for Houston. Okay, and so we saw this coming, say, okay, you, this time you are going to get hit. Right. But we saw it before everybody else. And so they were able to, you know, book up all the hotel rooms inland so they could do their business continuity thing, even though Houston was getting hit. Wow. <laughs> so, and so, you know, th th that's how we got started with the company. And since then, we, I don't have, you know, many like, petroleum companies, but a, a number of electric utilities you yes. know, in the Southeast US were vulnerable to hurricanes. We also do temperature forecasts. Um, we've been doing a lot with the insurance sector, um, right. mostly related to hurricanes. Um, we have, we've still kept our humanitarian stuff going. We're working, we have an agricultural project um, in Pakistan and India. Um, nice. Just helping the smallholder farmers, giving them better information so they know how much they should plant, you know, whether it's going to be a good season, uh, when to plant, when to fertilize, when to irrigate, you know, so they don't waste resources and, and help with the timing of the harvest. So that we're yeah. starting our second year on that project. So that's pretty exciting too. Now, so I, so I, my, my, my dance card is pretty full in terms of keeping myself busy. Oh, absolutely. I'm, and and uh, Peter is your uh, chief scientist and founder of, of CFAN, correct? Yeah, Peter Webster, yeah. Yeah. And OK, I got a question for you, because uh, I worked with some folks uh, a bazillion years ago. You know, Moses and I are friends um, down at uh, Louisiana. They had the uh, Super Mike supercomputer and they were managing the tidal flows in and out and everything else on a supercomputer. How is your so Do you have your stuff on a software? How is your model working on all this? Because all the oil you know, having that much data that you just described, saving lives, saving equipment and saving consumers because of pulling everybody out of the oil fields. How does your, your system work? Okay, we, we use the global model, global okay. weather model, model forecast, ensemble forecast. Um, the best one is the so-called European model. Okay. UCMWF, we purchase those forecasts. It's about a quarter of a million dollars a year. So it's not cheap to buy those forecasts. But the, the skill that we bring is 
what I would call, I guess, calibration. We correct for bias and distributional errors. So we improve the global model forecast. And then also something that's called ensemble interpretation. These models are ensemble forecast models. So each, each forecast time, they might run 50 different simulations of the forecast with slightly different initial conditions. And this helps us account for the uncertainty and the chaotic nature of the weather. And it's how, I mean, some people just take the mean of all that and call it right. the forecast, but there's a lot of more advanced ensemble interpretation techniques that you can use that we yeah, do that. Cool. And there's also the add-on modules, you know, like the right. hurricane landfall winds. We were combine that with a the stuff from the global models with a radio wind model and artificial intelligence, this and that to, you know, get the meaningful outputs. So we use a lot of machine learning, a lot of artificial um, intelligence, and also a lot of process models in conjunction with these global ensemble weather forecast. So that's, that's cool. Part of what we do on the weather side. And then we also have a climate side of the company okay. um, where, where people are where we're looking at. Um, I mostly like to go out maybe 30 years in the future. Okay. Um, and this is the and, and looking at regional decadal scenarios of what could happen. Right. Um, finished a project for a company that owns a bunch of wind farms and they wanted to know, well, is global warming going to cause the winds to slow down or anything awful like that? And we gave them a bunch of different scenarios. And our response to them is that, well, natural weather and climate variability is going to swamp any signal from global warming on a time scale of 30 years. And we gave them scenarios about how we thought that might play out. I mean, so that's an example of the type of thing we do on the climate thing. Um, also nice. do um, help educate corporations, you know, as they try to figure out what is their vulnerability to climate change from the actual climate and also from the policies that are being enacted, you know, which is a greater risk to them at this point. <laughs> uh, sometimes it's the policies and, and help educate them, help them deal with litigation matters, help with siting of equipment. Wow plants and whatever so it, it's working on some really interesting projects it's applied in the sense that there's somebody on the other end who actually wants this and is telling us right some parameters of, of what their issue is but it requires a lot of research and ingenuity to provide them with something useful so it's quite interesting from my perspective you know I still have the heart of a scientist you know I want to research right. and understand and whatever but I also like doing something useful I like seeing how all of this can be used to right. help you know it, electric utilities make better decisions insurance companies make better decisions right. about what they're doing both operationally and planning in the future and I also like the humanitarian side of what we do and I think that's very interesting, very rewarding. It's not particularly lucrative, but you know, I, I just feel good about yep. figuring out a way. You know, I think I, you know, I'm helping these smallhold farmers in Pakistan and India, coffee growers and whatever. And I that's think important. I, just I mean, like that. yeah, <laughs> I, I consider that extremely important, and yeah. and it. Um, we have a, an obligation to get the lowest cost kilowatt per hour to everybody on the planet. There's so many people that don't have low cost power. And, you know, if you're helping them with the weather and they can escape with their livestock, that's huge. Um, so I'm over here, you know, rooting for you. That's absolutely wonderful. Um, with your your company, how do they get a hold of you for CFAN? And and what is the best way? Uh, who is your target market? I think there's two questions. How do they get a hold of you? And who do you want as customers? Okay. Um, 
Well, insurance companies, electric utilities, energy trading yeah. companies, those are our main clients. Right. Um, on the also some municipal um, governments have been clients, state government have been clients. Right. Um, even the US government has <laughs> worked with a, a project for them. Um, I tend to do the larger kind of challenging projects. Nice. You know, with somebody hiring me to figure out what's going on in their backyard, you know, it's probably, you know, I tend to look at so you look at things, projects, yeah. So you look at something like uh, uh, like you just described, uh, all the uh, how the weather is impacting the Gulf of Mexico. Those kind of projects. Uh, well, sometimes they're very local. You know, a local. Okay. I did a local project for someone who was siting a power plant on the Florida coast, actually, and you know wanted to know well what is my vulner vulnerability from right. sea level rise and storm surge and that's pretty important yeah that, that kind of thing so it was very local but right. it was a high budget project i mean there was like a big piece of infrastructure that was at stake um so you know a range of different things i also work with companies like startup companies who are trying to do something new and different uh -huh. and um, i think that whether a climate information could feed into it. So I like to, I mean, I, I have a lot of conversations with those kind of companies and maybe one in five goes anywhere, but I like hearing what people are trying to do, right. and, and which is interesting in itself, and then trying to figure out if there's an angle that right. my company can help them and that we can you know, both mutually profit from. So I, I like, well, People, new ideas, interesting things. But you know, if you if you think back, uh, we would have never guessed that Tesla would be the, you know, electric car, and now we're seeing electric um, uh, airplanes everywhere. So maybe you know there are all these test uh, air um, electric vehicles are out there for the air. Maybe if you had C fan and Tesla merge. You could have weather maps inside, you know, the car, so you wouldn't get people like me that would get stuck in a tornado. Hmm. Uh, that is an interesting idea. Um, we don't do so much now casting. I mean, mm -hmm. we do a little bit. But our claim to fame is we can predict something usefully at longer time horizons. Oh, okay, that yeah. like our main thing. I mean, we well, can, you might want a spinoff then. If if we can get Elon on the phone, maybe he maybe you could uh, work with him there. Yeah. Well, right now I'm just really thrilled with what Elon's doing with Twitter. Isn't that it's fun? Opened it up. Oh, I was shadow banned on Twitter. I mean, I didn't know it until Elon. I mean, I was tweeting into the void. You know, no one would like, no one would retweet, no one right. would respond. I was tweeting into the void. I had maybe. 30,000 followers, which is, right. you know, it, it's medium potatoes, um, it's not totally small potatoes. But um, now I'm at 50,000 followers since Elon has taken over and I get lots of, lots of interaction, lots of traffic, and it's so much rewarding and interesting. And I've made new connections, people saying, oh, wow, you know, I've I just found you on Twitter. Well, I've been here since <laughs> 2009. Okay. And the issue is I'm, he's sort of, I guess I was shadow banned right. and, and, and why, you know, like I, apparently they were going after even people with really small followings that someone found objectionable. I would just love to see if one of these people doing investigating the Twitter files ever comes up with anything related to how <laughs> the climate issue has been sort of sanitized and shadow banned on Twitter. I don't oh, know if it's it, a enough deal, but I would love to see somebody do that. I got uh, uh, notified by the UN on my YouTube account because I had said some wrong things about climate change. So I got banned by the UN. I got that going for me. You know, if I if I can make the UN mad, I'm okay. <laughs> so I don't know. 
but uh, I am so thrilled about Twitter. I am having fun with Twitter again. I mean, it's like it was not there. I I don't have any followers at all. I'm a uh, I like it when I get trolled though. People think that it's I'm like all right, a different opinion. So I mean, if you as long as you look at it as fun, this getting yeah. serious over it is, and you're, and you're free to ignore whatever you want. I mean. I don't yeah. ban it. I don't block anybody. A few people I've muted just because they fill up my notification right. thread with endless junk. So I've just muted them. They can read what I write, but I don't want to hear from them. Right. I mean, you know, so, so that helps keep the experience a little bit saner. But um, yeah, no, I like it when somebody wants to engage me in a little bit of an adversarial way. Um, Absolutely. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I would rather have a little bit of adversarial and have good conversations. I would like to have, I want to hear all sides, but somebody that's a horse's butt behonkus, I'm not interested. So, um, well, I am, thank you very much, Dr. Curry, for stopping by our podcast today. Um, is there any last words? You got the last word right here. Okay. Well, Look for my book, Climate Uncertainty and Risk, published by Anthem Press. Um, come out next summer, and I would um, I look forward to people's reactions to it. I'll tell you what, after we get the book, uh, I want to read it and go through it. I, I love going through the books and earmarking it and everything else. So if you don't mind coming back, I really want to do a sure. deep dive on your book. So oh, for that, sure. All right. Well, thank you very much. Well, thank you.